In this video, we'll teach you all the secrets. Step by step, how to paint your miniature to this level. Hey everyone, you're watching Squidmar Miniatures and the first ever Squidmar Masterclass. It's quite a long video for being a squiddly one, but it's jam-packed from the beginning to the end with information and tips on how to become a better painter and how to paint using the techniques that I use every day when I paint box art level miniatures. And I hope this video is something that you can go back on, you can re-watch, you can jump to the different timestamps to check out how to paint armor or how to paint skin and learn from that, be inspired by or just be reminded by more than just once. And if you're here already, uh, it's probably not the first time you watch a Squidmar video. And you probably know that this video is made available thanks to the Kickstarter that we did last year, where we not only launched this miniature bust that we're painting in today's video, but five different ones, as well as this set of miniature paint brushes, which are my dream brushes. And if you didn't participate in the Kickstarter, you can still pre-order the brushes if you want them, link in the video description where you can pre-order both the brushes and of course the bust to paint along with this video. And with that, I guess we'll start painting. One thing that I almost always do when I paint is a zenithal highlight, which means that once I prime the miniature, in this case black, I use white ink and spray through my airbrush from above. Not only does this bring out the details so it's easier for me to see what I'm about to paint, but also the ink is translucent so it helps me build up the luminosity on the miniature and create gradients wherever I want. If you don't have an ink, you can use just a white spray primer and spray from above on your miniature or use regular white through the airbrush, but it tends to get a bit speckly so you don't get the same control, but it works just as fine. I want to put extra focus on the chest area and the face of the character as well as the squid on the shoulder so that when we start adding colors it's going to be brighter there and more vibrant especially on the squid where we're gonna paint with orange which really benefits from a brighter undercoat. If you paint orange directly on black you're gonna need a lot of layers and it's gonna kill some of the detail on the miniature so I definitely recommend you to use white and get that on first. And one of the tips I have is to not glue the arm on before you start painting. I used some blue tack to just get it on place when I was spraying the white and the primer. And then I could remove it to just reattach once I painted the skin on the belly, which is going to be the hard area to reach if I glue the arm on. I like to start with the biggest area first. In this case, it's the skin. If you're doing like me, painting a Caucasian skin, I'm starting with the Citadel color, Bugman's Glow. So normally when painting base coats like this on a large area, I would recommend you to use a cheaper brush, maybe a dry brush, makeup brush, or a cheaper synthetic brush, instead of being super careful with your expensive Kolinsky sable brushes. Or as I do, I'm using the airbrush. Because we just want to get this done and get on to the more fun parts. We're now gonna start highlighting the skin and to make your process easy, we need to load up your wet palette with all of these paints that we're gonna use for the skin. We start with the Bugman's Glow that was our base coat. We're also gonna add Cadian Flesh Tone, Vallejo Flat Flesh and Vallejo Sunny Skin Tone. And before we jump in on painting with a brush, I just want to show you quickly in Photoshop some of the things that I'm going to explain later while I'm painting. And the first one of them is that we don't want to highlight just the center of each of these muscles because that's going to create something that I like to refer to as muscle islands or highlighted islands. And this is not how muscles look on a human body. Instead what I want to do is to paint areas all the way up to the muscle groups that's over them. So on this example we paint all the way up to underneath the pectoral muscles. And then we highlight down and make sure that these stay connected. We also want to connect all of the groups underneath this. So we create a pathway here in between the muscles on that flat surface. And we travel our way down here and make sure that this highlight down here goes all the way up to the edge of this muscle. And then we're going to connect everything here in the center as well, because here we have sort of a flat line going up. And we make sure that they are connected. Something like this. So we just want to make sure that everything is connected like this instead of everything being in separate lonely islands and not looking like a human body does. But yeah, 
Let's show with the brush instead of talking. I'm gonna start with a mix of the shadow color, the base coat, Bugman's Glow that we had, and mix that with our first mid-tone, which is Cadian Flesh Tone. We mix these 50-50. I start off by adding some moist to the brush and then stirring in some of the paint into the bristles of the brush. I always like to add some white to the wet palette if I want to punch an area even a bit further than my brightest highlight color. In the end I didn't end up using it for this one, but it's always something I recommend you to do so you can punch the contrast however far that you want to go. I like to build up my highlights gradually. It gives smooth transitions from the get-go and it's also a lot easier for me to see where I need to go brighter after the previous layer. With the water and the moist that's already in the brush, we automatically get a thin down paint that's enough for us to start building up the layers without it being a super thick coat. Right now we're painting as if the light is coming from this angle. You can see the way that I'm holding the brush, uh, which means that the main highlights would be hitting on these areas here. And you see that we have sort of a, a shadow here. This one will have to cover up with some highlight because the light would be coming from that angle. Same thing here, you can see this whole area here, flat, is painting towards the light source. That also means that the shadow wouldn't be only like directly under the miniatures, but actually a little bit on this side as well of each muscle group. So that's something to keep in mind on, depending on which angle you decided your light comes from, is that you have to adjust the shadows to that. The consistency of this first paint we're adding is what we like to call a layer, which means that it covers fully in one go. As shown when I painted in Photoshop, we're going to cover a majority of the areas with this first highlight, only leaving the areas that's going to be in shadow pointing directly downwards. And again, I want to remind you how important it is to paint all the way up to the edges, to the furthest point at the top, just below the shadowy areas. If you don't paint all the way up, it's going to look like lonely islands and we don't want that. Another reminder is to paint these connections between the muscles. So every line between a muscle group, make sure to highlight that. For the second highlight, we're going in with even more Cadian Flesh. This time I'm just adding it to the mix I already have, creating somewhat of a 80-20 mix of Cadian Flesh Tone and Bugman's Glow. I repeat the same step as before, but adding it to a slightly smaller surface, both locally on each muscle, but also on the general area, which is the whole miniature. I wouldn't add as much highlights underneath the armpits, for example, or at the bottom of the body as I would on the chest area and the face where most light would be hitting. And again, as we're adding more highlights, it's so important that the brightest point and you always add the highlights furthest up to all the edges. So under the pectoral muscles, all the way up. On the chest area, all the way up. The highlight shouldn't be on the center of the muscles. So at this point we've used the Cadian Flesh Tone we're gonna use and the Bugman's Glow we're gonna use. And this is how the miniature is gonna look after that. There are no perfect blends yet, everything looks quite rough and the layers are visibly clear. But we're going to fix that in the later steps and it's going to look better the more we start adding. But first we're gonna start painting the face. If you're using a Kolinsky sable paintbrush like the Squid Mar 1, Da Vinci, Raphael, Winsor Newton or Artist Opus, you can see how easy it is for me to just follow the shapes of the miniature. And this is one of the things why I enjoy painting with Kolinsky sable brushes so much is that it just follows the shapes and it's easy for me to go all the way up to the edges without hairs splintering and going on places where it shouldn't go. The first layer of highlight we're adding, the mix between the Cadian Flesh Tone and Bugman's Glow, it's going to cover pretty much all of the face except the parts that in the deepest shadow. 
Because the face is where most light would be hidden, so we wouldn't have as much harsh shadows in the face as we maybe would directly underneath the pecs or underneath the armpits. And that means that even the parts that are slightly angled or on the side towards uh, the viewer also need this mix of color. Because if we don't, we're not gonna get this smooth transition to the highlights that we want. It's going to look way too much contrasty. And as you can see, when I add layers, I'm not painting with super thin down paints, but also not thick coats where one layer fills the whole surface and adds texture of paint. For me, it's about gradually building up the layers and the volumes and the shapes. So with this we're done with the first layer of skin on the body and on the face and now it's time to do a step of the object source lighting that we have on the side of the miniature. I'm using Vallejo Scurvy Green as a nice dark green base for our magic light. Remember not to move the airbrush around too much but actually just use the direction that you want the light to come from. And the reason why we're doing this now and not later is because if we do it in a later step it might affect the highlights that we're gonna add to the skin. So we're gonna start adding this now so it's not gonna ruin what we do later. Again this is one of the few steps where I'm using an airbrush and you don't need to use the airbrush for this step but really does help. If you don't have an airbrush you can do what we did in my OSL painting video where you take a photo of the miniature using a flashlight from underneath to kind of show you where the light would be hitting if you go from this angle and use that photo as a reference. And then you can just use the regular paintbrush to add these lights. You also don't want the airbrush to cover too large part of the belly, but you want to feather the spraying so you want some of it to leak up to underneath the muscles. You can do this by spraying away from the model a bit so that the paint just grazes the muscles on the torso creating a green shadow from below. And with that we're back to painting the chest again. Cause now we've done the shadowy part that would otherwise maybe affect the highlights that we're gonna paint in now. On some of these bottom muscles on the side where we just sprayed, we got some green covering where there would be the natural light hitting. So we're gonna paint back with some Bugman's Glow and Cadian Flesh Tone to some of these muscle areas where we ruined it with green. And we're just adding it to the areas that are pointing towards the sky. And when that is done, it's time to start the proper highlighting. I'm mixing Cadian Flesh Tone and Flat Flesh 50-50 and then working our way up to a clean flat flesh. Again, this second highlight, we have to remember that the highlight needs to go all the way up to all of the muscle groups and connect all of the muscles. But it also needs to cover a slightly less surface than the previous highlights on the bottom parts of the muscles. This way we get a nice transition from bright at the top to darker at the bottom. And for those of you who are analyzing my brush strokes, you can see that I'm not moving my brush back and forth, left and right. But most of the strokes are done in the same direction following the shape of the miniature. And this is what gives me the smooth transitions and the great control of the brush and the paint that leaves the brush. Every painter have their own techniques and every painter does it differently, but this is what I tend to go back to when creating these smooth transitions while painting layers. Another thing that I want you to pick up when you see me paint this is that I'm not painting anything that's in shadow. So I'm not painting anything that's underneath the arm because that would be in shadows. That would be our Bugman's glow only color. I'm not highlighting anything underneath there. And this is what I mean with highlighting both locally on say a chest area, I would highlight from this area down here, but also from the whole miniature general shape is to have it brighter on the face and the chest than it is on the bottom or underneath the arms. So 
So with the previous highlight step done, we're gonna start adding some sunny skin tone to these mixes. I start by just adding a tiny bit of sunny skin tone to this Cadian Flesh Tone flat flesh mix that we have. And then I'm gonna work my way up for each highlight that I add and then adding it to a smaller and smaller surface the more sunny skin tone we have to the mix. And this is the final time I'm gonna say it. Don't forget to connect the muscle groups and don't forget to paint the highlights all the way up to each of the areas. And once we've done this, one or two layers, adding a bit more and more sunny skin tone, you're gonna see that we're at a really nice place with highlights. But because we used a bit thinned down paints, if you want to punch it a bit more on certain areas, maybe there's one edge that you want to shine a bit more, maybe add a clean sunny skin tone there, or maybe add a bit of white or ivory to the mix and punch it even a bit more to make it feel glossier. That is totally up to you and at this stage also if you don't feel like you have smooth transitions you can use really thin down paints and blend between say the cadian flesh tone and the flat flesh on the areas that we already painted but because we have such a simple color scheme where we know exactly which colors we use it's going to be easy for you to go back and change things we also haven't used any washes which changes the color and makes it really hard to adjust if you did something wrong so don't be afraid of going back and changing things or adding things afterwards because that is what the whole painting process is about it's an organic process where we can add or remove things as we go and you're gonna see that later in this video that even i who is not a beginner painter do this all the time So now that we're done with the chest, we're gonna go into highlighting the face. We're going to use the exact same process that we used on the skin, using the same colors, highlighting the areas with flat flesh, cadian flesh tone, and sunny skin tone. There's a few areas on the face that needs extra attention. Obviously on the nose, the forehead, and the cheekbones, but also on the chin and down here underneath the cheekbone. One of the reasons why it's so important to have a wet palette is that it makes it so much easier for you to blend colors on the palette and create gradual transitions already on the palette before you start adding it to the face. This is definitely one of the main reasons why it's so easy for me to get smooth transitions. And on the face I like to work with a little bit more thin down colors. It just gives me more control and it's easier for me to work my way up and spend a little bit more time adding more layers rather than just going all out and adding thick coats from the get go.
On the forehead, I like to create three different highlights. Obviously, we already painted in the mid-tone here with the Cadian Flesh Tone and Bugman's Glow Mix. But after that, I like to place my brightest highlights on three points here and one in the center. So I want to get like a smooth, not shadow, but mid-tone in between these and then highlights on the edges and the center. If you have a more angled light coming from one side, maybe you wouldn't paint this one, but with this one being almost from the top, it's kind of nice to have three highlights. And use your whole brush arsenal for this. I use stippling, I use cross hatching, I use dragging my brush backwards, anything that works. Just be brave, work your way up, be patient, and then it's gonna look great. Don't forget the details. You have an area on the side of the lip, for example, that's pointing up towards the sky. Highlighting areas like this, details that you might forget otherwise, is what's gonna punch your highlights to the next level. And if you're having a hard time knowing exactly where to place highlights or how much light you're gonna add in certain areas, take a print screen of this video or maybe check my images on Instagram, how much light I added to each of the parts and use that as a reference, always going back and forth when you're painting. Because I know it's hard when you paint a face the first time or the first 20 times to know how much light you wanna have. So I always recommend using a reference until you feel certain enough that you can do it by your own memory. Also give yourself the time that you need. It's not a race, it's about having fun in the process and learning and becoming a better painter or just having fun in the end of it. So with the face highlighted, we got the chest highlighted, it's time to block in the other colors because at this stage you kind of want to punch through some of the steps to make it feel more alive and make the parts come together a bit more. So I'm basing all of the leathers with Rhinox Hide. I'm painting the hair, mixing Mornfang Brown and Rhinox Hide. I'm painting all of the metallic parts with Dark Sea Blue. The squid is painted with Troll Slayer Orange. And the few gold parts we have are a mix of Mornfang Brown and Scrofulous Brown from Vallejo. So friends, get ready and hyped to paint leather, because I'm really happy with how this ended up looking. We're going to use three main colors when we paint the leather, but you're gonna leave some of that sunny skin tone on the palette that you used for painting the skin, just in case you want to punch the contrast even a bit further. Rhinox Hide was the base coat that we already did. We're now gonna add Dumbul Brown and Deathclaw Brown as our two highlight colors. The first thing that we do is to add Dumbul Brown. I'm painting a consistency somewhere between layering and glazing, meaning that one layer doesn't cover fully, but it's also not a thin, translucent paint. Somewhere in between that. When I paint leather, I almost always use stippling, and that helps me create texture on the surface. 
I'm using that to about 50% of the leathery surfaces, focusing on all of the raised areas that's towards the sky and everything that bends inwards or outwards in a concave or convex shape. But as mentioned, we're only using it to about 50%. That means that quite a large surface is still gonna be just the base coat Rhinox Hide, a very dark brown. Once the first layer is done and dried, we're gonna mix in 50% Deathclaw Brown to the Rhinox Hide. And we're quite quickly moving into smaller surfaces of highlighting, this time mixing in a 50-50 of the Dumble Brown and Deathclaw Brown. We're still working with pretty much the same consistency between glazes and layering. And when that is done, we're going in with a clean Deathclaw Brown, again, going into an even smaller surface than we did with the previous highlight. This time, I would guess it's about on maybe 10% of the total of the leather areas that's being highlighted with this color. And you can see I'm using the medium Squidmore brush here, just using brush strokes from the same angle to get the control where I want the paint. And as a final thing, I'm adding in a tiny bit of sunny skin tone to this Deathclaw Brown. It's not much and I'm not adding it to a lot of surfaces. I still want the leather to be kind of dark brownish. So I just want to punch a few areas, maybe not even 5% of the total of the leather areas are used with this. And I'm only adding it to the brighter hairs that I've done before using the Deathclaw Brown. And with that we got really nice looking leather. If you want to punch it a bit more you can create micro scratches using maybe a tiny brush or an extra small brush making super super fine strokes. I did not want a very worn leather for this so I'm not doing it on my piece but if you want to go there feel free to do that using a thin down sunny skin tone with a small brush. So with the leather done, the skin done, we're gonna jump into painting some hair. We're gonna start with a stubble on the side hair of his head and that is done in a few different steps. This one takes a little bit of time to paint but not using shortcuts, doing just a wash on this really does add a lot to the final feel of the miniature and you're gonna see that once it's done it really does look like a shaved hair on the side that just started growing out. But we are going to start creating somewhat of a wash between a few different colors. I'm mixing dark sea blue on the palette together with Bugman's Glow. And that was the first skin tone we added as well as the blue we're using for the armor parts. And you can see how thin down the paint is by shaking my thumb here. And on the wet palette, of course, you can see that it's mostly just water and just a little bit of this paint. And I'm painting it all the way around on the head. If this wash isn't completely fully covering everything and you can see some of that base coat shining through, that's totally fine. It just adds to the organic natural feel of the hair growing out unevenly on the head. We're now going to highlight it in two different steps. And these two steps really does require some patience. It's not a difficult time but you need a good tip of the brush and you need some time. I start by stippling some Mornfang brown in small dots on the top of the head and working my way down. You don't have to cover fully with this, it's just to add some of that color that we have on the top of the head and bring it into the sort of stubble that we have on the side. When this is done, I'm going to take a clean brown sand into my brush, again making super tiny dots. These dots are so small, if you feel like you have a lot of control, you can create small scratches or small lines, kind of like creating an angle of the hair. If not, just do tiny dots and that's gonna be fine. And it is with these tiny dots that it's starting to look like a shaved hair just starting to grow out. To highlight the top part of the head we're going to use Doomball Brown, Deathclaw Brown and Ivory. We're going to create two main highlighted areas on the head, leaving the center of the head dark and the most front and the most back of the hair is going to be dark as well. Starting with Dumbled Brown, we're following the general shape of the hair at this stage. Going from left to right, covering the whole area, not painting any single hairs.
for the second layer we're mixing in some Deathclaw Brown to the mix. And for the third one we're doing a clean Deathclaw Brown. And it is with this one I start doing single hairs and not following the general shape, but just adding some strands to some of the smaller shapes that's on the miniature. With this one's done, I'm adding a bit of ivory into the Deathclaw Brown. It's maybe 30% ivory, 70% Deathclaw Brown. You will find your own preferred mix here. And just painting in a few strands in the center of the hair. On the back of the hair though, I'm not going as far. I'm not adding in any ivory to the mix. I feel happy with just adding Deathclaw Brown as the final highlight. And on this specific step, you're gonna see some of that organic painting that I mentioned earlier where I'm gonna go back and change something. I feel like I painted the highlight a bit too far in the front. So I'm gonna take some of that Doombull Brown and just glaze it to make it feel darker in the front and create more of a transition upwards. And going back and forth like this is really again what painting is about and what learning is about. Once you see you've done something wrong, don't be ashamed of changing it, going back and repainting it, because that's how you're gonna learn. So friends, it's finally starting to look really good. It's time to paint some armor. And I really love this step. So follow along with me and learn how to paint NMM. For the armor, we want to create a green and blue shining armor, sort of magical in the light. We base coated everything with dark sea blue already, which means that we want to mix in our first highlight, mixing dark sea blue with Elysian green 50-50. So again, we have the light coming from this angle, which means that this area is the one that's closest to the light source and same thing here. But since these are almost like two completely separate objects, so what I want to do is to highlight it accordingly. So we have the top part here being the brightest. We're going to have the brightest point here and on this side here, on this side here and on this side here. So this is where we would have our main highlights. But because this is a steel, we want also to have a secondary reflection with light bouncing up from the environment. So, so we're gonna do a secondary highlight on all of these different shapes on the bottom side that's slightly less bright than the top ones that we just added. And once you've added the first layer of Elysian green mixed with dark sea blue, we just go up adding a clean Elysian green and then start adding some ivory to the mix going on even smaller surfaces. On the bottom parts, as I mentioned before, where we are reflecting light and not have the direct light, we don't want to add ivory to the mix. Just using Elysian green will be enough for that highlight. And then we focus the brighter points with ivory on the top, finishing it off with just a clean ivory on tiny, tiny surfaces. Again, I like to create texture on metallics and leather, so I'm stippling in these highlights. And I don't want to have like a straight line of that highlight. For me, it's better to have like stippled texture. And this clean ivory, you just want to have it on a tiny surface, otherwise it's going to dull down the rest and change the balance between the shadow, mid-tone and highlight. So friends, now it's time to jump on to his wristband armor thingy. So metallics have a weird way of bouncing light. It doesn't really work like skin or cloth or leather does. So what we want to do is we want to find these curves on the sides, like this for example, where the armor is bent. And this is where we will have our main highlights. We'll do that on both of the sides of this wristband. But we're also going to frame the whole piece, which means that I'm going to add a highlight line on this inner surface here, all the way around, a really thin one. Uh, but we want to cover the whole side all the way around. You also want to cover these tiny edges up here, like this, but leave sort of the side of this flat shadowed so you have a separation from the inner part and the raised edge. 
And lastly, I'm going to add something that I like to call a secondary reflection. And this is something that just brings a lot of life to something. So it doesn't feel too arranged, but actually feels a bit natural. So I'm going to add a bit of a second highlight here. And this one I'm not going to go all the way with, as we did with the two first one. This one I want to cover from left all the way to the edge up here. The secondary one, we just want it to come in a little bit of the way like that. But let's show that on the real miniature so you'll understand better what I mean. So as I've already showed you on the computer, when we paint these layers, it's important to go from one side to the other, all the way to the edges. If we don't, we're not following the shape of the part, we're doing something completely different. So it's always important to follow the whole shape from left to right. We're using the same colors as on the rings. So secondly, we add some Elysian green, and then we go up adding some ivory to it on less and less surfaces. And you might notice again that I'm moving the brush in the same direction, creating visible strokes. Again, I don't want this to be a super smooth thing. I want to have some texture on the armor. So creating visible brush strokes is a really good thing. And I do this by just always painting in the same direction when I'm painting metallics. And as I mentioned before, on the top of the bracers here, we have a secondary highlight and that one is not going across the whole shape. This will be more like a reflection of a bounced light or something. So we don't want it to fold the whole shape. We want it to look a bit more organic. And don't forget to paint the edges and all of the flaps pointing upwards towards the sky. And don't forget to paint the ornaments. But when you paint the ornaments, don't paint the whole ones. Just paint on the edges that's towards the sky and that's when it's gonna look most natural. The bracer is almost done. We have one step we're gonna do at the end of the painting process, but for now it's done. So I'm going to teach you something now that might be a bit contradictory because usually I like to have a lot of control when I paint, but when I do these edges on swords, I like to just experiment and let the brush go nuts and usually that makes my painting look better and more organic. As long as I get the edges of the blades painted properly and highlighted properly, the highlights across these areas, I'm just going crazy. Starting again with the Elysian green, and when I've done a layer of that on different areas, I start adding in some ivory, and for every step that I do, I go on a smaller and smaller surface. The consistency of this is quite thick, it's layer-like, and I just, as I say, go a little bit nuts. Like, be brave, try things out. And it's so fast to do this that if you fail, you can always redo it. Just cover the area again with the base color and do it again. And as I mentioned, the only thing you need to be proper with is the edges. Make sure that you have a clean edge highlight between the top part and the, the blade itself. Uh, but once you're done with that, I'm adding a layer of Rhinox hide to the top and this brown just contrasts so well with the blues and greens on the edges. Just makes the steel pop. So that's my recommendation. And there's gonna be a lot of repeating now as we're using the same colors for all of these parts. But what's important here is not what colors we're using, but where we are placing the highlights and what you can take away from that. This armor has these ornaments that are in sort of an S shape that looks like this. And we want to highlight 
the edge points of these, we want to highlight the top parts of these, and we want to highlight these sort of most sunken into areas. But on the areas that's underneath these, we're gonna leave those completely in shadow, except for when we add in a reflection from the squid, but that's for later. So as an example, we're adding in a highlight here, this edge here, the top part of the S here, and the edge. Same thing here. We have this raised area there. This bottom here. We have this area here. The top here. But also outside of these S's that are sort of local contrasts, we're working with the general shape of this whole sort of shoulder piece. And the shoulder piece is somewhat of a cylinder because it's bent here, it goes around on the back side as well, which means that we need to find sort of reflective areas on the general shape of the piece. I'm going to place a highlight here because I feel like this is the side of the, the cylinder shape. So I'm going to have a highlight going from the left all the way on the edge to this edge here as well as down here, because there is a little bit of bulge in there, so we want to create sort of a reflection bounce there. Really ties together everything. And again, guys, don't forget to frame everything. We want to have this bottom part highlighted, this inner edge here as well, as well as the raised borders up here. Going the same steps again, starting with dark sea blue and Elysian green mixed 50-50. Secondly, adding only Elysian Green. And then gradually adding more and more ivory to the Elysian Green, the smaller the surface we're painting on. And guys, when painting non-metallics metals, don't forget to paint the edges with a super thin down highlight. Because the way that light bounces and the way that we're painting it to look like real life just really adds to the feeling of the light collecting on the edge and bouncing towards the viewer. So edge highlighting metallics when painting NMM really does add a lot. It's also really nice if you don't paint the bottom side of these parts because that contrast with the dark shadow, dark sea blue and the highlighted edge just makes it pop a lot. As a sort of bonus thing to tie things together, we're going to create a reflective light from the color of the squid hair on the edge hair of the shoulder pads. On the ornaments that's closest to the squid, angled towards the squid, I'm glazing in a few layers of Troll Slayer orange on the bottom side of these ornaments. I always try to have around three points of a miniature that has the secondary or complementary color. Uh, and with the greens we have the sword, we have the shoulder pad, we have the bracers, we have the small rings on the chest as well as the, the buckle on the belt. So adding this orange to two of these ornaments really just ties together the whole piece. Having the orange brown on the head, having the orange here on the shoulder and the orange squid of course just makes the piece feel more as one as opposed to being separate parts painted separately so glazing one or two layers of this troll slayer orange really adds a lot
So friends, from the reflection of a squid to painting one of my favorite part of this miniature and that is the squid. We're gonna go really vibrant and we have a challenge over at my Patreon Discord and the challenge is to paint something vibrant. So if you're part of the Patreon, go to the Patreon Discord and join in the challenge to paint some part of a miniature really vibrant. If you're not a patron, you can become one. Anyone who is uh, pledged from the smallest level can join into the Discord chat. If you don't want to do that, that's totally fine. You can tag me in the text of your Instagram and uh, show me your pieces where you've gone really vibrant this week. So, on to painting. We're gonna add a few colors again to the wet palette. We have the Troll Slayer orange already there from the base coating. And now we're gonna have Luganeth orange and ivory. We want the squid to look almost satin, shiny, almost like it's still wet from the ocean. We also want it to be very colorful and poppy and I will show you the steps that I took while get this. And we're gonna do this with both colors as well as light placement. I start off by placing highlights where I think the light would be reflecting on a wet sea creature. It's a mix of Luganath orange and Troll Slayer orange. I add this to maybe 30% of the total of the miniature. It's mostly the areas that are raised towards the sky, but again, remember to add it all the way up to the edges of the parts and the areas that are mostly facing towards the light source. If you place it somewhere where it looks funky, again, don't worry, you can always go back and clean it up with your original base color. You can also see that I'm using a mixed brush technique of both dragging the brush and stippling. And again, I want to get some texture in there, leaving some of the areas with the mid-tone and some with the highlights and getting areas between these two where it's shadow really adds to this feeling of it being textured and not like a flat surface. Once the first highlight layer is done, I go in with a clean Luganath orange and just add this to the same surfaces but going slightly smaller, centered in the areas, except for in the top. Of course, I always paint the highlight all the way up to the top. But then on, say, the squid's arm, we go more centered. And keep stippling so we get this knotted texture coming out. For the third highlight, we're adding some ivory to this Luganath orange and doing the same, repeating the same process, going over a smaller surface. And once this is done, I'm bringing out Flash Gits Yellow. I really wanted a cold sort of punchy yellow and I'm taking a super thin down, almost like a wash again, and just glazing that over all of the highlights to bring some color, making it more vibrant in the highlights. This just really makes it look saturated. It's time to add some colors in the shadows. Instead of just adding blacks or making something a darker orange, we want to add some colder, redder tones. I've got a color called Screamer Pink. It's actually, I would say, more on the purple pink side. And this will be a perfect shadow color to keep that vibrancy and the warm tones of the highlights and making it cold and feel darker in the shadows, but still being colorful. And very similar to what we did with the bus cut, we're just creating a wash with this color. It's super thin down, mostly water, and just painting that into the shadows. You can go one or two or three layers with this, depending on how far you wanna go with the shadows, but this is one of the parts that just makes everything pop and brings out that contrast that we want to have and makes it feel vibrant. If we would just have gone with a darker orange, it would have felt a lot more desaturated. And now we're gonna paint the eyes of the squid and we're going to use the same colors that we had on the armor and bringing colors in from other pieces again really ties the parts together. So we're painting it with a dark sea blue as the base and human eyes we have irises and uh, pupils and things like that but this squid has some really dark eyes that gives a green shimmer. So around the eye we're going to paint a circular green shape. I start by mixing 
Elysian Green and Dark Sea Blue, and then going up to Elysian Green Clean. Just make sure that you have sort of this super dark, dark sea blue border around the eye still, so you get some separation from the orange and the eye. And to finish everything off, we're just gonna take a tiny speck of white on the tip of our brush and push it on the top side of the eye. It's gonna be reflecting the light source. So I almost felt done with the squid, but there was something a little bit off. So I went back in with some of the previous highlights that I had added that I wanted on a larger surface. I mixed some Troll Slayer Orange and Luganath Orange again and added it to some of the surfaces that I feel like I missed. I added some more of the Luganath Orange on the areas that I wanted to punch a little bit more. So it's never too late in the process to go back and change things. And again, a reminder, if you're used to painting with washes, this is a good reason to start practicing working without, because it's so much easier to go back and forth if there's something that goes wrong and it keeps the process more organic instead of a clear step-by-step. -step. As a final detail, when I felt happy with the highlights, I wanted to add some freckles to the squid. So I took some of that Screamer Pink again, thinned it down to somewhat of a glazed consistency and created some freckly dots all over the squid. When doing things like this, I recommend you to hold back at first and maybe just do a few of them and then take a few days off and then go back and add more if you feel like you need it. Because it's very easy to overdo and when you do things like this that changes everything, both shadows and lights, it's easier if you do it as the sort of final thing and make sure you don't go overboard because that's gonna be a bit more difficult to change back. It's not impossible, but it's gonna take more time. So friends, we're nearing the end. We're getting really, really close. And one of the things that make this specific paint job to pop is the magic glowing light from the side here. And we already created the base and established the light source. And now we just want to increase the vibrancy and the luminosity on the different parts. I'm adding scurvy green, livery green and yellow green to my wet palette and start highlighting the light effect. We want the light to be brightest at the bottom, where the magic that Ilanth is creating with his hand is collecting. So the first highlight is a mix of scurvy green and livery green. This highlight is added to pretty much all of the surfaces that are green from the airbrushing. This mix is naturally very thin because of the properties of the color, so you might have to go two layers where you want it to be the strongest at the bottom. But you can see that I'm going all the way up underneath the pecs and adding this highlight. And with that we're going to work our way up in the vibrancy of color yellow greenish tones. And we're doing the completely opposite of when we highlighted the skin. Instead of starting all the way up to the top, we're starting all the way at the bottom of muscles, underneath them where the shadows would be darkest. That's where we start adding the most of this green highlight. If you have a hard time kind of imagining this, you can just put your miniature upside down and start painting it upside down and you will get the same sort of feel for where the highlight should be, where you should place it all the way up to edges. And then you're just adding more and more of the brighter greens first on a smaller and smaller surfaces on the muscles and of course further further down and when we start adding yellow green we're only adding it to the bottom part the most bottom area here on the belt and on the skin we're not adding any of the yellow green up here or underneath the arm because those areas are further away from the light source so we wouldn't have as much of that yellow tones coming in we should be happy with just having some of that livery green up there And my idea with this magic is that it originates from his hands, so I'm just gonna repeat the same process on his hand in the center of the hand, similar to what I did to the box art bust. 
It's the same technique as we did on the side here. So friends, get ready to paint some eyes. I've done a really deep diving tutorials on how to paint eyes before and why we paint eyes the way that we do. Today I'm not gonna explain the why, but I'm going to show you the steps that I take to get to that point. If you want to go more deep on this subject, I will link the video up in the corner right here. So make sure that your arms are stabilized against the table because you're going to need every bit of stability you can have to get all of the details right. I start by covering the whole eye with Dumbo Brown. This will work both sort of as a shadow and as well bringing some of that reds into the eye. When that is done, I'm mixing about 50-50 with Dumbo Brown and Rockarth Flesh. And when I'm adding this, the consistency is about a glaze consistency, so to get a full coverage, I would probably have to do three laps of this to fully cover something. And I'm adding it to a slightly smaller surface than the Dumbo Brown, making sure that a little bit of the Dumbo Brown is showing through, especially around the edges. As a second layer, I'm adding a clean Ruckers flesh, again with a glaze consistency, and then just start adding more and more glazing into the center of the eye. Just make sure that it dries between every one of these laps that you're taking. For the final highlight of the eye white, I'm just adding 50% white to the rock art flesh and just glazing in that again in the center of the eye and with that we should have a really nice shape for the eyeball. And now we're heading into the iris. We start with a dark color, a dark sea blue. And this can again be quite difficult, so make sure that your arms are stabilized. You don't want to paint the whole iris in the center of the eyes because that's gonna look like deer in the headlights. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a half circle at the top part of the eye. I will then be mixing in some Elysian green, about 50-50 with dark sea blue, and then adding a little bit of white to it to create the highlight. I'm going to make sure that I still have a dark border around the iris when I place this highlight. And then I'm going to add a bit more white and then paint a little bit more on the bottom part of this highlighted area and do that maybe in two more steps. And this is gonna help us create a gradient that is a bit darker from the top and then brightest at its bottom. Don't add too much white because you don't want the iris to feel gray or too white. And if you add too much color, it's gonna look cartoony. That can be amazing sometimes, but this time we just want it to be a little bit brighter than the dark sea blue that we have on the edges. Darker at the top brighter at the bottom. And now it's time to paint the pupils. And this again can be really difficult and it can be really frustrating. Sometimes you have to repaint the eyes many times. Normally what I do is I take a clean brush that is moist, has a very good tip. I mix in some black in there and then just start stippling until I get a nice round shape. You want about half of the pupil to be covered by the eyelid. So again, we're painting a half circle at the top of the eye. To top things off, we need to have a reflection because pretty much every eye has a reflection of some light source. You can probably see one in my eyes right now. I will take some pure white at the top of my brush again, just dip the top, take that top of white and dot it between the iris and place that white highlight between the iris and the pupil. And with that, you should have an amazing looking eye or you have to repaint it again. But either way, it's an easy technique that will help you get amazing eyes. So my friends, we're heading into the last bit and that is all of the gold details. I have a few paints on the wet palette. We have Scruffulous Brown, we have Sun Yellow, and we have Ivory. So when it's time to paint the gold, we have to figure out all of the different shapes of the miniature. Everything that is a cylinder, for example, like the pommel here. We want to shape the part by painting the edges of it, and then place the highlights on the side, because the light would be bouncing on the side of the pommel. So this is where we will place the highlight on something like this. If we, however, have something like a half sphere or a sphere, we need to place the highlight on the top part of this half sphere, something like this. That is similar to what we have on the necklace down here, for example, the small golden beads down here, as well as the back of the pommel. So this is where we will place the highlight. Highlighting metallics can be a bit difficult the first time. Similar to the hair, we want to highlight all the convex and concave surfaces, uh, those that are bent inwards and outwards, that is. And on the back of the pommel and on the jewelry on the neck, for example, those are 
sort of spherical or half spheres and those want to highlight on the center pointing upwards. On the cylinder part of the pommel I will place the highlight on the side as well on the edges to frame it, similarly to what we did with the metallic armor. The first layer is just a clean scrofulous brown. I will then start gradually adding more ivory into the scrofulous brown as I go higher and higher on the highlight and on smaller and smaller surface. And painting gold like this, it's 99% about the placement of the highlights and not about which colors you use. So if you want to paint green steel or red steel, you can use the exact same techniques but with different colors, just the placement is what's important. And as a final thing to make the gold really shiny is to take some of that sun yellow, create a glaze or a wash with it and go over these areas that you've highlighted before. This yellow again adds vibrancy and makes it feel more shiny. If you don't add this you're going to have a more of a matte gold or a saturated gold which can look amazing but for me I like to adding that sun yellow to it and just making it pop. And with this, if you're painting with just a brush, the miniature can be done by now. I want to make the miniature pop a little bit more, I want to add some of that magic feel to it. So we're gonna add two more steps to it, let's call it the advanced adding a few things with the airbrush technique. And number one with this is skin tones. I like to add a little bit of magenta or crimson reds into some of the areas where maybe it would be a bit more blush or it would be areas with a thin skin. So I'm going to add a few drops of inks, mixing ivory and magenta into the airbrush with a lot of water or airbrush thinner. And then just spray this thinly on these areas where I want to have a little bit more of a reddish tone. You can also spray some of this on a squid if you like, that can bring some of those colors even more together and blend it together, create smooth transitions. And the last step, and definitely one of my favorite steps that just makes the armor pop, is I'm going to add some green inks. I'm using P3 green ink on this one. Just making sure that I cover all of the skin areas so you don't have any greens leak over to the skin tones because that's gonna look a bit funky. And just spraying a thin layer of green ink here and as you can see it just brings everything together, it brings the shadows and highlights together both on the shoulder pad and on his arm. There's one thing though when you airbrush inks like this it's going to change both the colors of the highlights and the shadows and I kind of want to have the highlights to be a little bit warmer so I added a little bit of Dorn Yellow and Ivory to the wet palette and just stippled in a few of these highlights back in. I didn't have to add it to a lot of areas, I didn't have to add it across the whole areas, just stippling in this detail where I wanted it to pop a little bit more and it just brought everything again together so much. The warmer highlights, the colder shadows. And with that, the whole miniature is done. This is exactly the steps that I took to paint this miniature. Yeah. 
and I hope that you are brave to try this out and try to follow this tutorial and bring yourself to the next level when painting. And if you do, I, guys, don't forget to tag me on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever so I can see what you guys are doing with these busts. If you've been enjoying this video and you aren't subscribed already, what are you doing with your life? Hit the subscribe button. Maybe press like while you're at it as well. That really helps the video spread to new people. If you want to support me making these videos and making this uh, channel, I do have a Patreon where you can pledge a few dollars. It really helps and you get access to that cool Discord where we have small challenges every week and we talk about life and hobby in general. It's a really good place to be. If you have any questions about the tools that I use when I paint, I have it all listed on my website as well as in the video description. So check that out. And with that said, guys, have a great day. Bye-bye.